Então, boa noite a todos. É, é um prazer a, estar aqui é, junto à física biológica, né, apresentando o professor Rodrigo Soto Bertrand, que é da Universidade de Chile, Departamento de Física, e ele é o diretor do grupo de matéria ativa da, do Departamento de Física da Universidade de Chile. É, ele vai nos apresentar hoje Physics of Active Matter, isso vai ser em inglês, né? e How Quantitative Can We Get? Então, professor Rodrigo, por favor, a palavra é suja. Ok. Uh, thank you, Leonardo. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to, to talk to you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I cannot speak Portuguese, so I, I have to give my, my lecture in in English. Um, so I, I, I want to, to talk about the what we have been doing on the study of active matter. I'm going to describe precisely what we mean by active matter. And in particular, uh, the, our question is how quantitative can we get using the concepts of active matter to describe biological physics? But the more proper question uh, for this talk is how quantitative we want to be. Uh, because normally in physics, if you want to describe uh, biological systems, there's a temptation to add uh, many terms to describe small effects. Uh, and uh, it's not clear at the end if you uh, still do, you're still doing physics in describing those systems. If you add too, too many de details and if those details actually are really necessary. So uh, I'm going to present a, a, a broad picture of active matter and what we think is important of active matter. And then I'm going to present one or two stories that we have been working uh, in the past years. Uh, so this is a, is a work that we've been doing in the physics department at the University of Chile. Uh, I'm doing essentially theory, but I'm in collaboration with Professor Maria Luisa Cordero, uh, that she does experiments with bacteria and uh, some students and postdocs here in the, the, the physics department. Uh, here I have uh, mentioned, I'm mentioning some students that uh, were previously in, the, in, in our group and now they are uh, working abroad. And those are uh, external collaborations of our group. And in particular, I want to mention uh, the group of Miguel Concha, uh, also at the University of Chile, but in the School of Medicine, that he's doing experiments with uh, uh, fish embryos. Uh, so we have experiments with the fish embryos and uh, with bacteria and the group of Eric Clement uh, the, in France, where they, they also do experiments with bacteria. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know how, how many of you have heard of the concept of active matter, but uh, for us uh, is a, uh, uh, quite general concept that uh, uh, describes systems made of many elements, uh, but where each element can inject energy into the system uh, and generate motion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and the elements can be microscopic, like bacteria in this case, or uh, all, even the cilia for the propagation of, of, a, of a cell or they can be macroscopic like a fish or bird that like they move move collectively in 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 flocks or schools mm -hmm. so uh from a very pure uh approach in physics we can we can think that in the statistical mechanics point of view as an ensemble of elements but each element here is a motor uh, it's not an atom, it's not a molecule, or it's not a colloid, but it's a motor that is all the time injecting and dissipating energy. Uh, and why uh, are we interested in those in, in active matter? First, uh, because it has become a, a, a framework to describe, starting from the concept of physics, to describe biological systems. So the idea is that we're going to use standard tools or develop new tools from physics to describe biological systems. And uh, here I have to be clear that 
uh, that means that we are not doing all biophysics, all biological physics. Uh, there are many systems in biology that they cannot be understood as, as active matter in the sense that you have elements injecting energy into the system. So it's not the whole uh, uh, broad area of biophysics, but it's, it's a specific area, uh, subset of biophysics, but uh, this active matter concept allows to, to describe some of the systems. From the physical point of view, also active matter is important because it's a paradigm of out of equilibrium systems, because here each element is injecting energy uh, into the system. So uh, now uh, the system is out of equilibrium, but not because it's being forced by boundary conditions or initial conditions, but it's being forced from the inside. Mm -hmm. And the, the question is, are new phenomena that appear because of this kind of driving? And finally, it's, it's important uh, because uh, there are some applications that have been proposed and some of them are already in application. For example, in micro-robotics, and when I say micro-robotics, I really mean robots in the scale of microns or 10 of microns and that are made uh, sometimes uh, of uh, made of hybrid materials, part biological, part synthetic. Also for precision medicine, for example, in this uh, dream that is not so far now that you can inject uh, drugs inside inside a, 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 a small robot that can swim uh, in inside the body, get into uh, to, to the, for example, the cancer cells and release there and just there a, a drug. Mm -hmm. And so, so it has, has been proposed as a, um, as a method to do precision medicine. So uh, I want to first to describe some properties of active matter and some phenomena that ha has been discovered in the in the past years uh, by our group, but also uh, by different people. Uh, uh, here, uh, yeah, just to give you an idea of the kind of things that we do, the, this is a sim uh, an experiment, sorry, I was saying a simulation, an experiment of a bacterial bath uh, that is moving here the little dots are bacteria and you see some large particles that are um, uh, color, uh, uh, spherical bits of latex that we put in the in the bath and they are used as a proxy to measure the activity of the bath that is we move we, we measure how they move and we want to see uh, if with that we can determine the the motion the activity of this of this bath Okay, so, so so the first essential property of uh, active matter it is a non-equilibrium system, because as I said, you have energy injection all the time, and uh, that uh, implies that, uh, for example, the dynamics are typically non-variational. Non-variational means that the system is not looking for uh, to achieve a, a minimum in energy, for example. Typical in equilibrium systems, the, the dynamics is driven by a free energy. You want to minimize, the system evolves to minimize the free energy or some function like this. Here, uh, you have dynamics that is non-variational, meaning that you are not minimizing something and complex phenomena can appear. And typically the complex phenomena that you have is pattern formation. Here is a, is a carpet of uh, microtubules that are aligned, attached to a surface and they, they move and they create these, these waves. So you have patterns and you have a chaos typically. But also in a biological systems, a, you have, I said, I, you have many elements uh, that each element can inject the energy into the system. But you have you have many, but you, you don't have infinite number of, of elements, and you don't have uh, an Avogadro number of elements. Typically, you can have millions, uh, billions eventually. But that 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 those are the typical numbers. You can have much less. You can, uh, in a small embryo, you can have I don't know, hundreds of thousands of of cells, no more than this, and then you have large fluctuations. So you have noise here acting all the time. And this noise 
is amplified. We don't know yet how exactly, but it's amplified by, by this non-variational dynamics. That is, for example, here you see an experiment, a very beautiful experiment. We have micro microtubules with actin, with, mo with molecular motors, sorry. And uh, those motors are moving the, the, the filaments and you see that it's very noisy and you have many defects that are created uh, and destroyed all the time. And it, it looks like a liquid crystal, but it's, but it's very different from a liquid crystal. In a liquid crystal, you know that defects tend to disappear in the, in the course of time because the free energy is, being, uh, 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 is going down all the time. So uh, to, to decrease the free energy, normally you merge defects and you, you reduce the number of defects. Here, because of the activity and the noises, uh, you have all the time the creation of many, many defects. So you have new phenomena uh, induced by defects and uh, noise-induced phase, tran phase transitions also. So, so the first property of active matter is that it's out of equilibrium and highly driven by noise. The second property that appeared, and actually that was probably the first big result in, in the study of active matter in the in 95, in the result uh, work by Bicek and simultaneously by Turner and Two, is that they show that it is possible. They, they, they were asking if it, why or how it's possible for birds or fish to move together collectively. And they discovered that actually it is possible. It is possible for bacteria, for example, or for birds to move collectively in the same direction. And you only need uh, to align with your neighbors. That is, uh, you don't need a leader. Uh, you just uh, need to look at your uh, few neighbors. And if everybody does that, then you can move collectively. And it was a, an important result because uh, there's a theorem of uh, solid state physics that said that it was impossible in equilibrium to align globally just looking for your neighbors in 2D. In 2D. So there, there was this result that said it was impossible and Bishek and Tony and too showed it was it is possible for active matter. And later people realized that was the key point is that you break Galilean invariance. It looks quite technical, but I'm going to come back to that. That is, what does a lack of Galilean invariance means is that birds or fish, fish, for example, they swim in a preferred, preferred reference frame. They, they swim in the fluid. So they, they cannot sw swim at any velocity. You cannot add all fish uh, uh, a constant B0 and you have the same physics. You don't have the same physics if everybody is swimming, if you add some velocities because they're moving against the fluid. This lack of Galilean invariance allows for alignment. Is, and we have used that uh, trick of active matter that the uh, uh, bacteria, for example, uh, tend to align to create these uh, uh, molecular motors. Uh, this is not moving, I don't know why, but okay. Uh, here we put bacteria, uh, magnetotactic bacteria inside a small droplet of hundreds of microns. And eventually everybody starts to move in the same direction to rotate. And what we create, the same as here, is what we call a motor made of motors. Because we have every uh, bacteria is a small motor, but we have millions of them and they collectively rotate. And we have a small motor made of this many bacteria. Next important property of active matter is that the interactions between the agents are non-reciprocal. Let, let, let me start with this uh, case, with the second case. Uh, I think it's easier. Uh, if you consider birds but that, that they, are, they, they are flying, the interaction in this case is, uh, is not physical in the sense that they exert forces, but they have some kind of cog cognitive interaction. That is, each bird sees 
uh, one of their, their neighbors, and then they decide to do something out of that information. For example, to uh, swim in the same, uh, to fly, sorry, <laughs> to fly in the same direction as uh, its neighbor. But birds have their eyes in front, so they see some of the birds, those in front, but they don't see those in the back, but those on the back see them. So this guy here is looking at this one, but this one is not looking at this. So the interactions are not reciprocal in the sense of Newton. Newton tells us in the uh, third law that if I interact with someone, this someone is interacting exactly the same amount with me. Also, if you consider bacteria, for example, those bacteria are swimming in, in a fluid. Uh, when they swim, they move the fluid around and this motion is going to move other bacteria, except some torques or some force on the, on the neighboring bacteria. But the force that this one exerts on that one is not the same as this one except on the other one because it's mediated by the fluid. Uh, of course, that the, that the forces are not equal is not uh, violating really Newton's third law because part of the momentum is taken away uh, by the uh, by the fluid. So that it, that is the global momentum. It is conserved, but if you just consider consider the momentum of the agents, uh, you don't have uh, a force uh, reciprocity like this. The same with the uh, with birds, and in, that's general of active matter. And uh, we use that that idea, for example, to take some colloids, and we said that the yellow ones are going to interact with the blue ones differently to the blue ones interacting with the yellow ones. And the result is something like this, uh, that eventually they merge, but because the blue ones are more attracted to the yellow than the yellow to the blues, finally they push and you get directed motion. So the, the, the fact that interactions are non-reciprocal generates immediately motion. Mm -hmm. And you create these colloidal molecules that are active and they self-propel or they can also even oscillate persist persistently. Uh, just because the interactions are non non reciprocal, and we are very happy because we we made those predictions some years ago, and then uh, recently some experiments appear uh, with the same kind of of phenomena, where they have in this case they are not colloids they are just small droplets that interact with some uh, micelles, but the interaction they tune it non to be reciprocal between the dark and the and the gray uh, droplets and you get you get motion so what have we learned uh, in statistical mechanics i know that I, I am in the biological physics section but uh, uh, i'm moving to that but uh, let, let me start with this because uh, this is uh, my motivation for doing uh, or doing active matter. So, from statistical mechanics, we have discovered that active matter differs from equilibrium, from equilibrium matter, in three uh, symmetry breakings, simultaneous symmetry breakings. You have temporal symmetry because you have you are out of equilibrium, you are injecting energy in some way, and dissipating energy in the other way. It is possible also to have spatial symmetry that that's quite trivial. You can design objects that are, uh, the head is different from the tail, for example, in a bacterium. A bacterium, the head is different from, from the flagella. And then you have temporal symmetry broken and spatial symmetry and you can get motion. But also, um, uh, active matter breaks Galilean invariance you have a preferred reference system and you break reciprocity. That is, you don't have action reaction. And people, uh, and this alone, history essentially since uh, 95, said, okay, 
we have physics with new symmetries that are broken. And then we can uh, be a uh, work like uh, in a Landau approach, let's say, Landau approach, saying, okay, what are the more general descriptions that we can do uh, just considering that some symmetries are broken? What, what new physics appear? Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, if you break some collision uh, uh, invariance, in which you Antonio two, you get flocking phases that all the elements move in the same direction. You can you can get some thermodynamics that are non-variational. There's a work of Kate's very interesting on that. You can have more in the biological aspects quorum sensing that is bacteria that measure the environment, but the, this quorum sensing is is not reciprocal. That is, this guy is reacting to the other one. Uh, not in a, in a symmetrical way. Um, there are theories for gels, for active gels to describe tissues, etc. There are different approaches. And the question that I want to, to discuss today with you is that those models predict new and uh, new physics and sometimes new universal properties. For example, that the flocking phases are tip, for example, they have, uh, there's a phase transition to flocking phases, etc. There are some interesting properties. And the question is, are the models that we build based on those symmetries, that is from a very basic physical approach, are really useful or relevant for biological matter? Okay, that, that, that's, that, that's the question. Because we can do many things here, and uh, people in biology can, can say, okay, who cares? Who cares? Because uh, you are very far from our experiments. Uh, you are describing a phenomena that never happened in biological systems. So who cares? Who cares? And uh, you, have, uh, you can play around with that, have fun with that, but this is not biological physics. Mm -hmm. So the... So that, that's why I, I, wa I want to, to, to describe first uh, a, a very basic-like approach of active matter. So for that, uh, okay, uh, I'm going to describe one or two stories, depending on time, um, that uh, we have uh, been working where we have uh, learned that those models are, the, the models that I'm saying here, are indeed useful, but you, not, you need to, to fix them. Typically, it's not enough, uh, the simplest approach, but still, uh, you're not full of parameters. So I, I want to describe the chemotaxis uh, of bacteria and, um, and our the, the experiments and the theory that we do is for E. coli, E. coli in suspension. That is, they're moving in a fluid and not they are not swarming on, on top of a, of a surface. Those are the typical parameters of, of uh, E. coli, the, the, the size and the and the speed, some tens of microns. And um, the standard model, the accepted model from the 70s, actually, from Berg. Uh, is saying that E. coli, uh, they move in what is called the run and tumble motion. Uh, this is a, a real track made by, by Berg in 72. Uh, it's a beautiful experiment where they were able to measure the, the position of E. coli in the course of time. And you can see that the uh, E. coli swims in a straight line with almost constant speed. Then randomly at some times that are supposed to be distributed in a with a Poisson distribution uh, with a rate nu, uh, the E. coli stop. It changes to a new direction. It changes directions and start swimming again. Mm -hmm. and, and the mechanism for that is uh, now is well, well understood. The uh, E. coli has many uh, flagella. When they rotate, they form a bundle that propels E. coli, but from time to time, 
with the, this rate mu, some of those flagella start to rotate in the opposite direction to the rest. And that makes that they bundle uh, this uh, disentangle and uh, the, the body stops. It, the trachea cannot swim because they are not rotating all, all, all the flagella in a coordinated way. And then they start again to rotate every all the flagella in the same direction, in the and the um, the bacteria starts swimming again, but now in a new direction. So this is the typical motion. And for the chemotaxis, uh, the idea is that swimmers cannot move, uh, cannot measure the gradient of food in such small size because E. coli measures just. Uh, one, two uh, uh, microns in the body. So what they do is that they run and during run, they measure if they're moving in the good direction, meaning that they, they are eating more, essentially. And if they're moving in the good direction, they decrease the tumbling rate. So that is, they run longer. And is they, if in the opposite case, if they're moving against the good direction, in the bad direction, they tumble more frequently. And that produces a biased random walk. So the, the, the concept is that the tumbling rate depends on the, uh, the moving direction uh, compared with the gradient of food. So if they're aligned, uh, you, you decrease your tumbling rate. And what we ask in the, in the lab, if uh, it was possible to measure the velocity, that was quite simple. The tumbling rate, uh, how the tumbling rate depends on the gradient. And this um, kernel that I didn't say, that is how uh, how do you choose the new direction knowing, knowing the previous direction of the swimmer. So we started with that. And what we found was very interesting because we discovered that the, this model that was the simplest model that you can build, uh, as I said, in a Landau-like approach that is, give me some elements and uh, uh, give me some symmetries and I can write the, the simplest model is not enough, but um, you can build something better that fits the experiments. So what we did is we did some experiments where we track bacteria in a microfluidic device like this, so those are uh, some tracks, 3D tracks. From the tracks, we were able to measure the director, where the bacteria is pointing. Uh, this is the director at time t, the director after a while. Uh, so the, there's a, an angle between the two directors, theta. And uh, so we measure how this theta uh, how the director uh, decorrelates. So that is, we measure the correlation function between the director at time t and at time and the displaced time. And the correlation function, uh, according to this Berg model, you were expecting an exponentially de decaying function. You can compute quite easily from this model that it's going to be an exponentially decaying function with a time, a typical time that depends on the tumbling rate. So we say, okay, that's going to be a very good way to determine the tumbling rate. And what we got is that actually exponential decays, but each exponential was decaying at a different rate. Uh, so we 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 fit exponentials, we meet we we fit the what we call the persistence time, how much time it takes for the exponential to decay. And for example, if you plot the correlation functions with this rescale time with the persistent time for each curve, all curves collapse to an exponential. So that's good. We have exponentials, but the persistence times were very different. And here uh, I present the results for different bacteria on different uh, culture media. And uh, you can see that in some cases, the persistence time is less than one second, and sometimes you get 50 seconds. So that is, some bacteria are tumbling all the time, and others were running for 50 seconds, and then they only, after that time, they change direction.
or making very long, long runs. And here the medium is homogeneous, so there's no chemical gradient yet. So the question is, how is it possible to have this large variability? And one possibility is that it is phenotypic. That is, uh, when we when we, we grew the uh, all the bacteria, some of them I don't know where by chance in a region where some chemicals produce that they were more tumblers, uh, other etc. So we repeat the experiment, and now we track a sim single bacteria, but now for very long times, minutes, several minutes, and it's a microfluidic device, so it was in the top, then it swim in the bulk, go to the bottom, etc., like this, and for each portion that it was swimming in the bulk, we proceed as before. That is, we compute the correlation function and we extract the persistent bulk. And here, the axis here is the bacterium ID. That is uh, uh, a particular bacterium. And for each bacterium, we, you see that at some moments it was tumbling very frequently, and then it was tumbling very rapidly. So we have variability, but it was not phenotypic, but dynamic. So each guy was uh, decided at some moment to tumble more or to tumble less. Fortunately, we discovered there's, there's a model for tumbling, uh, this model by uh, Duran Greenstein and, and Kolokova, where they said that the tumbling process is an activated process. That is, uh, the flagellum is rotating in one direction here, and as, uh, eventually it overcomes an energy barrier, it goes here, it doesn't like here the, this position, and it go, goes back to the run mode. So this is run, this is tumble, then it goes back to run, etc. And you say that the doubling rate is going to be, uh, there's an Arrhenius factor, depends, depending on the free energy barrier. But what they, they, they say is that the free energy barrier depends on the concentration of some protein this KYP protein, and, uh, and uh, the problem is that this protein inside the body is, uh, the methylation is quite slow, so for in the order of minutes. So during one minute, uh, the concentration can be low, meaning that the, the barrier is low, and the, the, the bacterium is going to tumble very frequently, and at some other moments, the concentration is going to be large, the barrier is going to be large, and uh, the bacterium is going to tumble less. Mm -hmm. So um, if you uh, uh, simply do a, a, a Taylor expansion of this free energy uh, with respect to the average value, you get that the tumbling rate is going to be um, a reference tumbling rate with an exponential dependence on x, where x is the uh, measures the normalized fluctuations of the protein. That is, is the fluctuation of the concentration of the protein divided by the variance. That is, x is taking values typically in the order of from minus one to one. So when it's uh, uh, negative, you are going to have less tumbles. When it's positive, you are going to have more tumbles. And um, uh, and it's evolving in time. So when you have something evolving in time that has fluctuations, you write a Langevin equation like this. And the prediction now is, is uh, very interesting because you say, okay, X, that is this relative uh, concentration in protein, uh, is fluctuating like a Gaussian variable. And this Gaussian variable uh, is uh, with average zero because it's relative to the reference value, but with some variance, one. So X is going to be Gaussian, meaning that that new, the tumbling rate is going to follow a log normal distribution. Mm -hmm. So I come back because 
what I uh, maybe you notice, but I didn't say, is that those persistence times are plot in log scale. Because when you have a log normal distribution, you expect that when you plot the logs, you get a Gaussian distribution. And okay, it's something like a Gaussian. Mm -hmm. So we have a, an explanation of why those uh, bacteria were tumbling sometimes more frequently than others. And it's simply because uh, the tumbling rate depends on an internal variable that is highly fluctuating. So we have to include fluctuations here, otherwise it's not working. And uh, now fitting the, the, the experiments, we were able to extract all the parameters. We have the tumbling rate or the tumbling uh, mean time that is 0.4.6 se seconds for our uh, strain of bacteria. The memory time, how much time, or the methylation time that I say, how much time the, the bacterium stays in a state is 20 seconds. So it's quite long times where they they can uh, keep in a mood of tumbling more or tumbling less. And what is important is that alpha is this number, 1.6, meaning that, as I said, X can go from minus one to one. So uh, it's a difference of two and exponential of two times 1.6 is exponential of three uh, is essential uh, is more than 10. Uh, saying that you can have in some moments bacteria tumbling 10 times more frequently than in other times. And that explains very nicely all the experiments. So I said it was related to chemotaxis and uh, I don't want to describe all the details of chemotaxis, but I said, Chemotaxis means that bacteria run longer when they are swimming in the good direction. So how do they do that? Simply, they adjust with a, a circuit inside the body. They adjust their the internal concentration of X depending on how much they are eating. Mm -hmm. Actually, the inject uh, the intake of food is the temporal derivative of L. Mm -hmm. And this temporal derivative is because the guys are swimming. So they, they're moving along the gradient and sometimes they're moving more or less. So uh, essentially, if they're moving in the good direction, X is going to become negative because this uh, value is positive. If it's moving in a good direction, X is going to be negative, and then the tumbling rate is going to be small. But if it's moving in the bad direction, this number is negative, X is going to be positive, and then you're going to have large tumbling rate. But it takes time for that. It takes 20 seconds for that. It's not immediate. And also you have fluctuations. Bacteria miss what they, uh, their target because X is fl highly fluctuating. No matter that it wants to move in the good direction, they, they, they miss the, the target. So um, here uh, we come back to physics. That is, <laughs> everything is physics. But uh, we do some experiments, we try to fit the parameters, and then we build a theory of, of out of that. Uh, is a uh, this is my expert expertise, statistical mechanics. So I do a, a kinetic theory, like a Boltzmann equation for, for the swimmers. And what we uh, were able to show is that if you take, take that model seriously, uh, you cannot use the user, uh, the standard Keller-Segal equation for bacteria. The Keller-Segal equation for bacteria is that that is density uh, is uh, probably advected by a flow, but they move, there's a current that depends on the diffusion process and the chemotactic current. That is, bacteria tend to move in the direction of the, of the food. And we said, if you take uh, our, uh, our experiment seriously, 
where you have memory and fluctuations, this is not the full answer. And the current depends on, also on the concentration of protein inside the body. So we, um, and this concentration is called rho x. So we have now a system of equations for the bacterial density and the concentration of proteins. Those are the equations with some transport coefficients. Uh, there, there are some references here where you can find the, the, the expressions for that. But I just want to show you one result. I, not, not, not analyze all the equations, but just simply that. If you put food, for example, here is a traveling signal of food, you know, moving your food, or you put uh, food in a in a position. Boy, what's that? Okay. If you put uh, food in in one position, then the bacteria are not going to go direct only to the food, but there's a kernel that is they miss the target, and the this kernel actually is a is a, a Lorentzian distribution, and they miss the target by. 100, in our case, 170 microns. That is, if you put a very precise signal, you create anyhow a signal of bacteria. And it's a, it's a cloud by large. It, of course, if you do, uh, a, I don't know, if you study a, an aquifer, a, a lake or a river, you don't care of this case. But it, now if you are studying a, a small capillary uh, or porous media, then it becomes very relevant that bacteria can miss importantly the target and generate responses that are highly non-local on the on how that bacteria is you. Okay, I think we are approaching the end. <laughs> so I'm going to show you without much explanation, sorry, uh, just some pictures just to show you other things that we can do in the same spirit. So I'm going to skip that. The other thing that we do, for example, is to study tissues like this. And this is a, a, a fish embryo where that is observed in a microscope. So it's a very different object. The other one's bacteria here, fish embryo. And we have uh, the cells. And we want to describe the mechanics of that tissue. And for that, uh, we observed that was a very nice uh, phenomenon taking place here, that some cells contract. Poof. You can see some of them that decrease their size. So it was a very useful proxy to study if uh, our models were working well, uh, because we were able in experiments to measure the air, how the area evolves, the perimeter evolves, etc. So uh, we built some model. We actually we took a model from the literature, standard model, and again, is this model quantitative? Can we get some numbers? And uh, Fernanda Perez that made some very nice analysis show that indeed we were able to reproduce the, uh, the experiments, but not always. Here, for example, this is the evolution of the area, and this is the evolution of the perimeters. The areas were, were nicely reproduced, but the perimeters not. And there, so we have to change the model. Mm -hmm. And the model, we have to change it, saying that to reproduce the experiments, cells have to contract, adding a force on the perimeter of the cell. Mm -hmm. And not the standard thing that people were thinking that uh, there was a, a, an activity on the on the membrane. Okay. So I, I don't want to uh, say too much. Uh, I, I, I prefer to, to answer some questions and discuss some uh, uh, some of the comments, but okay, sorry, this is important because it's made by uh, Pablo uh, Casagrande. It was previous, he's also 
is in uh, our PhD, uh, also uh, doing his studies in, in Brazil. And we have a model for this tissue, the same tissue, that has some elastic, uh, is, a, is a mechanical property, it's a mechanical model. And the question is, are all the cells equal? Because typically they say, people say, okay, all cells are equal because it's the simplest thing to do in physics. Put a, uh, all parameters equal, and we were not doing well on fitting. That is, we tried to fit the model and we were not successful until we let every cell have its own stiffness, K. And we and Paolo obtained very nicely that the stiffness is a decreasing function of area. That meaning that cells are not uniform, but cells are softer if they're larger. Okay. Okay, so I just want to, to say that. So uh active matter is uh is an uh as I say, it's an approach to some biological uh, systems. And uh, we can say many things from a qualitative point of view, uh, but probably not more than qualitatively, uh, if you just consider the simplest uh, physical models. That is the simplest models that include some uh, propagative objects to, to have, uh, if you have some special uh, 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 break, um, if you have some interactions that are not action reaction, okay, you can reproduce and pictures can look like the experiments, but just qualitatively. But you can get quantitatively if you uh, include typically fluctuations and variability and heterogeneity. In simple ways, but you have to include, uh, and that's what we have discovered in those uh, Two examples and also some examples that I didn't show that if you include fluctuations and variability and heterogeneity, you can get much closer to experiments. Mm -hmm. And of course, now that you can you validate the models, you can learn a lot of things. And now, for example, we're learning on the chemotactic process or how cells construct, etc. Okay, so uh, I think on on the time. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you for yeah. the marvelous seminar. Uh, from YouTube, we have lots of uh, okay. um, <laughs> no, no, lots of questions, but uh, they also thank for the wonderful seminar. In fact, okay. you start in a very general way and mm -hmm. then went to the details. That's what we expect from uh, a physicist's point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, there is one question which is quite general. I don't know if I understand. It's how did you get to this calculation? Mm, so, but it should explain which calculation is he talking about. Yes, probably. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, I have uh, uh, two questions. One is uh, about this last uh, embryo. Uh, mm -hmm. fish embryo that you you showed yes uh, so if i understood correctly the idea uh, in particular the, from paulo's work was to study uh micromechanics of cells that yes is, you you wanted to uh to see if you re using a, a simple vertex model for example if you could s somehow mimic what happens in a cell uh, during the uh, development of the embryo. Yes. So we were, um, uh, we have this experiment where the, they can track all the cells and we have a very quantitative description of the motion of all the cells. And uh, there is a model, this is a vertex model that says that uh, the cells uh, essentially want to um, uh, change their area or not change too much the area compared to a reference value and also they cut, they try to keep their perimeter. And so this is the standard, uh, one of the ways of, to present the standard model. And okay, we said 
uh, is this model able to reproduce experiments? That is, we took the, uh, the, the experiments, we put the, the same vertices, the same cells, and we solve the equations that appear from here. Mm -hmm. And so we say, okay, let's try to fit the, the stiffness K or the, 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 the areas, etc. And there was no way to fit all the parameters Unless oh, uh, there, there was no way to reproduce experiments, unless we let the stiffness to depend on the on the cell, and to to add some heterogeneity on the system, and saying that some cells are stiffer than others, that it may seem natural, but uh, what we found was was a very large variability, but that they depend strongly on the on a control parameter. Right. Wow, okay. Now, so that that's what this graph is saying. Okay. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Uh, there is another question, a new one. Could you please explain the Poisson distribution part again? I got confused if the distribution changed the direction of ba the bacteria or the time it runs. Okay. Yeah. Is the is a Poisson distribution for the times? That is. Uh, the the duration of this run uh, period uh, is uh, exponentially distributed. That is, it's a Poisson, Poisson process in the sense that at every time uh, the bacterium is deciding to tumble or not, and that gives you an exponential distribution of times. But once it decides to tumble, to decide to tumble, meaning that one flagellum is going to start rotating in the opposite direction, the new direction is essentially take it at random. Uh, you can see here that sometimes you have uh, 90 degrees, here you have almost 180 degrees turn, etc. So the, how direction sh changes is very randomly, but the Poisson distribution is essentially, uh, is related to the distribution of times. And what we found is that indeed they're po Poisson distributed, but the tumbling rate is evolving. It's evolving slowly yeah, in the in the uh, uh, scale of tens of twenty seconds. Sometimes it's tumbling more frequently, and sometimes it's tumbling less frequently. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I see no more questions. Uh, I have still one last <laughs> question. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, it, it's about the use of the vertex model because yeah. uh, I, I know that it, it cannot uh, support let's say uh, concave forms uh, if you yeah a cell may have a, a concave form and uh, mm -hmm. the vertex model is constructed by, uh, by convex neighbor, polygons we just look yeah convex complex. so uh, is is it uh, wouldn't it be a problem uh, describing with vertex model or you don't see at all negative uh, curvatures in the in the embryo okay. fish development it depends on the fish it depends ah. on the uh, and also depends on the on the uh, development phase uh, this is an er very early phase uh, where actually you here you see all the cells of the embryo it's not bigger than this. It's a very early phase uh, where you have the, the jolk um, and then you have a, a pap of cells that is spreading down and those are the cells that you see there. They're spreading down to cover the full egg. During this process, the tissue is very tense. There is a large stresses and that makes that all cells are com convex. Mm -hmm. But then later, there are some uh, stages of the uh, of the embryo where uh, it becomes more floppy, and if it's floppy, it's easier to get uh, concave, concave shapes. And the answer is that in that in those cases, you cannot use these simple vertex-like models. Okay, but in the very beginning, you you, you can. Yes, in the very beginning, okay. we can. I see. And they are almost two D. Those cells, they are very mm -hmm. shallow. Perfect. Okay, thank you once more and thank you for the 
nice webinar. Uh, Thank you. I, I should I should be reading for you all the the, the writings of YouTube, but uh, I can't now. Nice. Uh, so the, most uh, uh, most people really like it. So thank you once more. And thank you, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, to see you soon. Any question that you you have, you can write me. Uh, I didn't put my email, but if you look Rodrigo Soto Universidad Chile, is quite easy. You'll find perfect. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. See you. Okay, I think caímos do YouTube. Yeah, we're getting, we got out of YouTube. <laughs> we're out of YouTube. Okay. Yes. Okay. It was really good, Rodrigo. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I really like. It is strange. Uh, 